Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. And so begins the poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, recalling the actions of the revolutionary hero. Now contrast his heroic response to that of Colonel Johann Rall, a Hessian commander who was fighting for the British. Rall had received a message that General George Washington and his Continental Army had secretly crossed the Delaware River this morning and they're advancing on Trenton where the Hessians were camped. Well, rather than speaking directly to the spy delivering the message, the spy was instructed to, to write his message on a piece of paper and the note was then delivered to the colonel, but without reading it, he stuffed the note in a pocket because he wanted to stay focused on the task at hand, a poker game. And so when the guards began firing their muskets to stop Washington's army, Rawl was still playing cards, and it was too late. The Hessian army was captured, giving the colonists their first major victory of the war. Today we continue our series from 2 Timothy titled, Guard the Treasure. Paul urged Timothy, and he's also urging us, to guard the treasure of our faith in Jesus. And yet to guard the treasure, we've learned that we must first guard our hearts. And Paul said to do that requires the attitude and discipline of a soldier, one who keeps his mind focused on the mission rather than be distracted by lesser things, as Johann Rall was. Paul says, Let, like an athlete, we must play by the rules. We don't get to ignore them, and we don't get to make up our own rules when they interfere with our goals or our desires. And he said we must have the work ethic and patience of a farmer, that we do our part while trusting God to do his part. To guard the treasure, we must also guard our words. King Solomon said that words are very powerful. In fact, they can give life or take it away. And if not careful, as we looked at last week, our words can actually aid the work of Satan and hinder or obstruct the work of God. So today we're going to go back to 2 Timothy 2.25. And here we see the purpose for guarding our words. And hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. So if we look at this verse, we can see an important truth that we have to be aware of and also tells us how to deal with this truth. According to Paul, some have been taken captive by the devil and they are doing the devil's will. Unfortunately, most people in this situation don't even realize that they've been taken captive. They have no idea that they are living under Satan's spell. However, the good news is that spell can be broken. Paul says it comes to repentance in responding to the knowledge of the truth about Jesus. And that's why our focus this morning is guard your life. I'm guessing that Johann Rawl had no idea that he was derelict in his duties until it was too late. And so I wonder, could the same be said of you and me? If someone were to evaluate your faith and how you live it out, would they see you more like Paul Revere or Johann Rawl? Do they see you as someone who is committed, whatever the cost, or someone who is distracted with lesser things in life? One who takes action or one who keeps putting it off? Let's move into 2 Timothy 3. Paul describes the characteristics of each of these. Verse 1, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. I'm sorry, I think I read that one already. Um, they will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends be reckless and puffed up with pride, and they will love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, 
but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And so according to Paul, there will be difficult times in the last days. And people always ask, okay, do you think we are in the last days? And the answer is absolutely yes. I know for a fact we are in the last days because according to the apostle Peter in Acts 2, when the, when the Holy Spirit showed up, he's explaining Jesus in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He said, that is part of the last days, which means we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. But here's the thing. Every generation has had reason to believe that Jesus could come in their lifetime. There's always been evil in our world, and there always will be. And yet, when you look at the world today and you compare it to what Paul said that last days would be like, it accurately describes our present age. Let's look at his description. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Some versions read perilous times. Did you know that there have been more Christians martyred or killed for their faith in the last 100 years than in all of history combined? Now, we don't experience that in our country. But for many Christians throughout the world, it is definitely perilous times. And yet, even here in the United States, we have those who, who teach tolerance and who teach acceptance, but rarely are they tolerant of Christians. In fact, they're more intolerant of us than any other group. Paul explains why. Verse 2, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be puffed up with pride and love, and love pleasure rather than God. So the reason Christianity strikes anger in others is because it points out and it confronts people's selfishness. And it calls us to humble ourselves before an almighty God. Now, we live in a society that believes we have the right to live however we want, and it is absolutely no one else's business to say otherwise. In fact, our current culture has eliminated the concept of right and wrong. The new, uh, the new acceptable standard is my truth. I get to make up my own rules. But here's the thing. That attitude is not just out there. We all tend to do that. Each of us tend to ignore and twist the teachings of God that we don't like. And just like the world, our choices are determined by our selfish desires. Our love for self and our love for money and love for pleasure. I mean, if we're honest, we too can be boastful and proud and disobedient to parents and ungrateful. And there are times that we are unloving and unforgiving. We slander others and we lack self-control. It's not uncommon for Christians to betray their friends. We put our trust in money, and we love pleasure more than God. And we, too, act religious while rejecting the power that could make us godly. So as Paul described the world in the last days, he's also describing Christians, those who claim to follow Jesus but don't really surrender. I mean, we want him to be our savior. We want to be forgiven so we can have access to heaven. Again, so Jesus will connect us to that spirit in the sky. We want that. But we struggle to submit to him as Lord of our lives. And as a result, our lives often resemble the world around us. A few years back, George Gallup, after conducting a poll and analyzing the research, said, there is little difference in ethical behavior between the church and the unchurched. There's as much pilferage and dishonesty among the churched as the unchurched. And he says, I'm afraid that applies pretty much across the board. Religion per se is really not life-changing. People cite it as important, for instance, in overcoming depression, but it doesn't have primacy in determining behavior, end quote. In other words, People claim that their faith is important to them, and they will turn to their faith in time of need, yet rarely does it affect how they live on a daily basis. 
And yet, as we read the book of Acts, we see a completely different picture. For the early followers of Jesus, faith transformed how they thought and how they lived. It affected every area of their lives. So let me ask you, how was your faith? Is it merely head knowledge and intellectual agreement? Yes, I believe God created the world. Yes, I know I fall short of his standards. Yes, I believe he sent his son to die for me and cover my sins. Do you believe that? Do you acknowledge that as true? If so, praise God. Because guarding the treasure begins with what you believe. Paul said in verse 14, you must be, remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Timothy had not only learned from the Apostle Paul, but he learned from his mother and his grandmother. They had given him a solid foundation in the Word of God. Unfortunately, many today have dismissed God in the Bible as outdated and irrelevant, which I guess kind of makes sense because it contradicts their desire to live however they want. So why would it be relevant? Kind of reminds me of two guys that had a dispute. They went to arbitration to settle the matter. The plaintiff made his case. He was very eloquent in his reasoning. And when he finished, the judge nodded in approval and said, you're right. Well, the defendant jumped up and said, wait a second, judge. You haven't even heard my side of the story yet. And the judge said, oh, you're right. State your case. Well, he too was very persuasive. And when he finished, the judge said, you're right. The court clerk heard this, and she said, judge, both people cannot be right. And the judge looked at the clerk and said, you're right. Two opposite sides cannot both be right. Now, there may be some truth on both sides, but even then, both sides could be wrong. However, both sides cannot be right. Again, they can have part of the truth, but it doesn't make them right. And yet, we live in a world that claims that they can. And it's having a negative effect on how people live. A few years back, a group of seminary professors were meeting, and one reported that his school, the most damaging charge one student can lodge against another is, you're being judgmental. And he said, you can't even get a good discussion in class anymore because as soon as someone takes a stand on an important issue, somebody else says, hey, wait a minute, you're being judgmental. That's the end of the discussion. Everyone's intimidated. Now it's gone even further. These days, if you disagree with someone, you're not only judging, but you're accused of targeting. Yes, Jesus calls us to be loving. Jesus calls us to be civil. But does being civil mean that we can't have an opinion? Does it mean we can't evaluate what's going on around us? Does it mean that we have to approve and agree with everything that people believe and everything that people do? It's one thing to insist that people have the right to express their beliefs and their convictions. Yes, that, that, that's the right thing. You should be able to express them, and, you know, that's fine. But it is another thing to say, those convictions are right, and I have to accept them. In fact, to say that all beliefs and all values are valid and all deserve to be treated equal, it doesn't even make sense. And here's the other thing. They say everything is valid, everything should be accepted, but they reject my beliefs and they reject my values in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this question. Because everybody has to write to, you know, identify somewhere. If I show up at the White House and I identify myself as the President of the United States, do you think they're going to show me to the Oval Office? I don't think so. So it, it just doesn't make sense. And here's the thing. It is impossible to be non-judgmental because the minute you tell me, hey, you're being judgmental, are you not judging? Basically, so let me summarize all this. Paul is telling Timothy, there is a lot of bad philosophy out there, so be grounded in God's word and know what you believe and hold on to it tightly. And yet, if we want to experience the power of God, we must not only believe it, 
we must live it out. We must act on what we know is true. Verse 10, Paul said, but you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live, my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. Belief is only the beginning. Belief is not faith unless we live out what we believe. Ken Davis shared about the time that he was in college and he had to prepare a lesson, a lesson to teach in speech class. And he says, we're going to be graded on our creativity and our ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. So the title of my talk was The Law of the Pendulum. Now, we understand a pendulum goes back and forth. He said, I spent 20 minutes carefully teaching the physical principle that governs the swinging pendulum. And the law of the pendulum is this. A pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point from which it was released. Because of friction and gravity, as the pendulum returns, it will fall short of its original release point. And each time that it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally it's at rest, which is the state of equilibrium. Well, all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. He said that I then attached a three-foot string to a child's toy top, and I secured it to the blackboard with a thumbtack. I pulled the top to one side, and I made a mark on the blackboard where it started, and then I let it go. And each time it swung back, I made a new mark. It took less than a minute for the, for the top to stop swinging and come to a rest. When I finished the demonstration, the markings on the blackboard proved my thesis. It was, they kept getting lower and lower and lower. And so I asked the people in the room, how many of you believe the law of the pendulum is true? Every student raised their hand, as did the professor. He started to walk to the front of the room, thinking the class was over. But in reality, it had just begun. Hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room, I had rigged up a large and crude but functional pendulum. I had 250 pounds of metal weights tied to four strands of parachute rope. And so I invited the instructor here, climb up on this table and sit in this chair, put your head against the wall, and I brought this pendulum up to his nose. Holding just a fraction of an inch from his face, I once again explained the law of the pendulum, which he had applauded only moments before. And I said, if the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this mass of metal, it's going to swing across the room, and when it returns to the release point, your nose will be in no danger. And after that final restatement of the law, I looked him in the eye and I asked, sir, do you believe this law is true? There was a long pause. Huge beads of sweat formed on his upper lip. And then weakly he nodded and whispered, yes. So I released the pendulum. And it made a swooshing sound as it arced across the room. And as far at the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily. And it started back. And I never saw a man move so quickly in my life. He literally dove from the table. Stepping around the swinging pendulum, I then asked a the class, does he believe the law of the pendulum? And they unanimously answered, no, he does not. It is not enough to agree in our minds or even confess with our mouth that we believe in Jesus. Unless we are willing to act upon that truth, we really don't believe. Now, Paul proclaimed, I know the one whom I have believed in and whom I trust, and his life backed it up. What does your life say about your faith? G.K. Chesterton said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried. Because it is difficult to say no to self and no to the pleasures of this world. It is hard to resist temptation and to wait on God. It makes no sense that, that we will have more for ourselves as we generously give away to God and to others. And it's not easy to go against a crowd, especially when you're doing so by yourself. And yet, when we know what we believe and we live it out, it initiates the power of God in our lives. Things begin to fall into place, things that we can't explain. Unexpected blessings come our way. 
and our relationships begin to improve because we're not fighting and we're not manipulating to get our way any longer because we're trusting God. When we trust God with all of our heart, the Bible says we stop leaning on our own understanding. We're acknowledging him, acknowledging him in everything we do, and as we do, he makes our path straight. And as he makes our path straight, much of the frustration in life is eliminated as well as its consequences. So if life is better when we follow Jesus, why is it so difficult to do so? Why do we get off track so easily? Why do we talk about it rather than live it out? Well, I guess because when we see that large pendulum swinging towards our head, it's hard to think clearly and it's hard to think rationally. Doubt enters our mind and it's hard to trust. And that's why there's a third component to our faith that is just as important as believing and acting on God's word. We must know our purpose. Timothy, you certainly know what I teach, how I live, and what my purpose is. And Paul's purpose was simple. To proclaim Jesus as the answer to life's mystery. And it was his belief in who Jesus was and why he came along with his desire to live in response to that truth that gave birth to his purpose and to his mission. And when he had that purpose, and he was clear on that purpose, it grounded his faith, it increased his love for people, and it gave him the strength to endure persecution and suffering. Because his purpose took him out of the center of life, and it put God there instead. And you and I can experience the same strength, the same hope, and the same love when we find our purpose in Jesus. Someone has said, when you're up to your neck in alligators, it's difficult to keep your mind on the fact that your primary objective is to drain the swamp. Isn't that true? Uh, Darren was telling me about the time that they were driving in Florida and, and they had a flat tire. It was a large vehicle with a very small jack. And so he was afraid it was going to fall over. So Stacy and the kids, they were little at the time. Uh, they had to wait outside the vehicle, near the swamp, where the alligators lived, and sometimes would climb up to the side of the road. So Darren's trying to jack up the car, preoccupied with watching for alligators. And it was not going so well. And then out of the blue, uh, help showed up. They did not speak a word of English, but they knew how to change the tire. So while Darren watched for alligators, his new friends were able to focus on the task at hand, and soon everyone was back on their way. When we're distracted by the alligators in life, our faith wavers. When we're distracted by the alligators of life, we're concerned with our struggles and our fears, and it's hard to live by faith. However, when our resp response is rooted in Christ, we're reminded that God's watching our back. And when knowing that he's watching our back and he's going to handle any situation far better than we can, then we can give our attention to sharing the message and let him worry about the alligators. And as we do, we're not only more productive, but we have a lot more peace. Paul said knowing our purpose gives us patience, the ability to love, and the struggle to endure. So where is your focus? on the distractions of this life or the purpose that God gave you for this life to shine the light of Jesus in a dark world. This passage reveals three truths. Number one, God's word is true. Life is exactly the way Paul said it was going to be in the last days. Number two, people and society are getting worse, not better. The world is lost and they are in need of Jesus. He's the only hope. Because he changes hearts, and then he changes behavior. And number three, Jesus is calling you and me to share the message. Because as we believe it and we live out our purpose, not only will our faith grow, but our little corner of the world will become a better place. Jesus is your answer. And so if, if you don't know him as your savior, or your Lord, and you would like to talk or you would like to pray with someone, I'll be up front following the service. Our elders will be in the back, or you can grab anyone. We would love to share our faith with you because 
Jesus is the answer to everything we're facing. Doesn't make life perfect. But he makes life better, and he gives us a reason for living, a reason that will last for eternity. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that as we live our life this week, and God, there's always alligators out there. We don't always see them, but we know they're there lurking, and we get distracted with them. God, I pray that we would trust you and know that you're watching the swamp. We just need to focus on our faith and loving Jesus and sharing that love of Jesus with those around us. God, show us in a very real way how real you are and how it will affect our life for the better. Not only for us, but for those around us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.